Isaiah chapter 16. Dealing with uh, Moab, as, as I said um, earlier, this dealing with God's judgment upon the various nations there. Let me remind you uh, of the chapter breakups. In, in chapters 1 through 39, Isaiah points out the sins of both the northern and southern kingdom, which brings about God's judgment upon uh, the children of Israel, God's children, because of their idolatry and them forsaking God, in a sense, taking a step back. Leaving God. And then we come to chapters 40 and 50 through 55, and it speaks of the return and restoration after the Babylonian exile. Seventy years in captivity, and God then takes his people out of Babylon and brings them back to to Israel to rebuild the the temple. Uh, Speaking of God's grace and God's love for his people, that, that he doesn't always correct them and judge them that in a way that would last a while, it's always to draw them back to himself as they have backslidden from the Lord. And then, of course, chapters 56 through 66, Isaiah writes concerning the new heaven and the new earth, and I can't wait to get there when he gives us great detail about the new heaven and the new earth that is awaiting us as believers. And that's exciting because that's our hope, right? And this earth is not everything, and it shouldn't be everything to us. Uh, we should be keeping our eyes on what's ahead of us and what God has for us. Uh, here on this earth, we are sojourners and just pilgrims, just kind of wandering through, sharing the gospel, being light and salt to the world. And one day, God will come for us, and he will take us out of this world, judge the world, and then we will be in heaven for eternity with him. And I can't wait for that day. <clears throat> now, Chapters 13 through 27, Isaiah delivers a judgment from the Lord to these various nations, uh, principally to Babylon, who will rise up and crush Judah and try to destroy Jerusalem. Actually, does destroy Jerusalem and makes them into uh, a heap of rubble, in a sense. And Isaiah warns all the other nations that God is... Uh, going to judge them and take away their glory because of their sin. The Assyrians at this point are gaining great power politically, economically, and also militarily. Uh, They're rising as a great nation. It reminds us of today with Russia. Russia is beginning to grow again. Russia is beginning to show its political power, its economic power, and now its military power. Politically, they're saying that, that Russia may be a little stronger than we are now because of what they're doing there with the UK. And if you don't know this, you'll read the newsletter this coming up Sunday. But I just read, uh, someone sent me a, a, uh, a news article that Russia has made an agreement with Iran to build another nuclear plant. So that much closer to, to Israel. And so militarily, economically, they have a lot of gas in their area. There was a time where they didn't have uh, so much gas years ago, about you know, 20 years ago or so. But now they have enough natural gas resources they, that can supply for them. And not only for them, but also for the nations that is supplying their needs economically. And of course, militarily, we see them just going in there, bringing the military in. So... Uh, <clears throat> Like Russia, the Assyrians are also growing at this time. And God is speaking to the surrounding nations that they will be uh, in battle with the Assyrian army. And and in a sense, God is going to use the Assyrian army to judge the nations like Moab, the Ethiopians, um, and so forth. And so we'll we'll read those things. So let's look at this counsel to Joab in chapter 16, verse 1. Send the lamb to the ruler of the land. From Shelah to the wilderness, to the mount of the daughter of Zion. Now, when it's speaking of the Lamb, you might think, well, is it talking about Jesus Christ who is the Lamb of God? No. What it's talking about here is that Isaiah is is encouraging the rulers of the land to once again resume giving tribute to Jerusalem. They had been giving tribute to Jerusalem because Jerusalem had conquered them. And so they were giving tribute to Jerusalem, sending money and resources and so forth. And then they had stopped thinking that they were uh, great now as as a little nation and they no longer needed to give those resources to to Jerusalem. And so they stopped sending the lambs. And so Isaiah is saying you need to start doing it again before God judges you. Uh, You can read about this type of tribute in 2 Kings chapter 3, 4 through 5. 
uh, where Misha, king of Moab, uh, who once paid tribute to Israel, stopped doing so when King Ahab of Israel had died. And so Ahab's power, his authority had ceased, and so Moab felt like we no longer needed to pay that tribute, so they're going to be judged because of that. For it shall be as a wandering bird thrown out of its nest. Now, you get the idea that Moab will be like a wandering bird. It will be confused. It's thrown out of its nest. It doesn't know where it's going. So the confusion that will come upon them when God judges them. So shall be the daughters of Moab at the ford of Aaron. <clears throat> uh, Moab, remember, is on the eastern side there of the Dead Sea. It's actually uh, Jordan today uh, that uh, Moab used to dwell in in that area. So he says, take counsel, execute judgment, make your shadows like the night in the middle of the day. Hide the outcast, do not betray him who escapes. Now Isaiah's word to Judah, uh, as she observes Moab under this judgment, was to take care of those outcast. Isaiah wanted Judah to, to place refuge there in Moab Well. Israel was being attacked, in a sense, help Israel once again. Join forces with them as they will also be judged. And so there's this plea for refuge among Moab in the days of the righteous king. Look at verse 4. Let my outcast dwell with you, O Moab, and be a shelter to them from the face of the spoiler, for the executioner is at end, devastation ceases, the oppressors are consumed out of the land. Now, Prophetically, this is speaking here. Now, remember, uh, there's events that are taking place at the moment of Isaiah, at the moment of Moab and these nations, but there are also events that are speaking of future events. And here's one of those areas where it's speaking of a future events prophetically. God has a one more seven-year cycle to take place uh, in the nation Israel. Now, if you go to the book of Daniel, don't turn there, but Daniel chapter 9 and chapter 12, you, you will find the prophecies concerning the end times. You'll find the prophecy that, that foretold that Jesus would come riding in on a donkey into Jerusalem on March 14th, 44, uh, 5 BC, April 6, uh, 32 AD. Uh, you find the prophecy of the seven-year tribulation period, the, the 69 weeks, the seven uh, weeks of Daniel, but 69 of those weeks have been fulfilled, and there's still yet one seven week to be fulfilled, which were years when you calculate it. So it's speaking of the tribulation period, and that is still waiting to be fulfilled. And then the Antichrist will be rising through that, right around the middle somewhere, bring peace. Some believe that the temple may be built right around that time. We're not sure but probably during the um, tribulation period, maybe even before uh, the rapture takes place, we're hearing about it today, that there's a lot of talk about rebuilding of the temple, and some of these scholars in Israel are saying that we don't necessarily have to build the temple where the Dome of the Rock is. They will probably put a wall between the Dome of the Rock and the southern part uh, of of the old city there in Jerusalem where the temple uh, used to be and build the temple there. There's enough room for the temple to be built there. Some also suggest that it's on top of Solomon's uh, tomb there in that area. And if you look down further south, you have the city of David and then you overlook uh, uh, that whole area, city of David from Jerusalem and you have Gehenna, the valley running down on the side and the hills and so forth. And so it's, it would be the perfect place to rebuild the temple. And so when that temple is rebuilt, then we will see the Antichrist rise and he will go into the temple and he will desecrate the temple and he will make himself out to be God and demand worship upon himself. And this is when Israel is supposed to flee to Petra. And so in Matthew, what, chapter 24, where he talks about uh, the two being in the field and one will, will flee, they're to literally leave everything. If they're on the housetop, don't go back for your cloak. Just run for the hills because at that time, God's judgment will come upon uh, this world at the midpoint of the seven-year tribulation period. So this is one of those faraway fulfillment of prophecies we see in Matthew chapter 24. And according to Jesus, when the Antichrist demands the worship of God, and then Jerusalem will flee to the mountains. Then he says in verse 5, In mercy the throne will be established, 
the one will sit on it in truth in the tabernacle of David, judging and seeking justice and hastening righteousness. Now, that is speaking of Jesus Christ. Daniel chapter 12. When that mid-period comes during the tribulation period, then God's judgment begins to come upon the world, and then Jesus Christ will be building His army, and He will once, uh, once and for all come and judge uh, the Antichrist, the beast, and the false prophet during that time, and then He will sit on the throne of God and judge righteously. And that's where we will gather before His feet. Now He goes back, to the present, and Moab's pride brings this judgment upon uh, their nation. We have heard of the pride of Moab. So they were a prideful nation. Now, what is pride? Pride is depending on yourself. Basically, that is what pride is. It's, de- it's putting dependence on yourself. You can handle the situation. You know, whatever that situation, if, if you are running a great nation, then, then we are a great nation. We can handle ourselves, we can defend ourselves, we can take care of ourselves economically, politically, militarily. You know, we have pride. That's what pride is. If you run your household and, and you're the one in charge and you'll take care of these things and you'll handle these situations, that is pride when God is not involved in it. Pride is just basically taking control of things. When you take control of it and... Don't allow God to take control of it. What's the opposite of pride? Humility. And that's the best place to to really walk is in humility. If you want to please God, then walk in humility. It's a hard thing to do, to always walk in humility. To be a person that says, I need you, Lord, at all times. I can't run my life without you. I need your direction. I need your wisdom. I I need you to direct me and guide me. As soon as I say, I will handle this, then I'm walking in pride. But as soon as I say, Lord, can you help me handle this? Then that's in humility. And if someone comes up against you, if someone accuses you, then humility is always the best place is just to leave it alone. Let God deal with the situation. Instead of handling the situation, you take it to prayer and fight against it with the, um, with the armor of God in prayer. The, you know, the, the, the shods of our feet, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith and so forth. You know, fighting spiritual battles and not the fleshly battles. And so Moab had pride. They didn't need God. And so God would judge them. He is very proud of his haughtiness and his pride, and his wrath. But his lies shall not be so. So God is going to use the lords of these nations to break them down and destroy Moab in its pride. Therefore Moab shall wail for Moab. So Moab shall wail for Moab. You know, it's sad when you see an individual <clears throat> walking with the Lord and then, and then they take steps backwards. What do you mean by step backwards? Well, there are those that, that, that get excited and they get involved. And, and for whatever reason, you know, and there's a hundred reasons, they, they start slacking off. They start taking steps backwards. And that's the beginning of their fall. Pretty soon they step down. Pretty soon they're not doing anything. Pretty soon they're running things on their own. And, and then their family is mourning for their family. They're going through things and they're wondering, why are we going through this? Why is this suffering happening? Why am I dealing with this situation? What is going on? You know, and then they realize that through God's grace and mercy and Him allowing suffering to come in or allowing the correction of the Lord to come in, then they realize it's because I've left the Lord and I've walked back. You know, and God won't allow you to be there. He wants you to always be going forward. Always being... Uh, the person that says, okay, Lord, now what? Not, not can I let go of this, Lord, but what can I do with this, Lord, and what you have entrusted me with? But it's sad when, when you see families mourning over their own families, you know, fathers and, and husbands mourning over their own wives and children, and then children mourning over the fact that they're in, going through all of these things, and it's all because they've you know, left the Lord and where they were at. I don't believe God's called us to walk backwards. God's called us to go from glory to glory. I was in a um, <clears throat> a situation where where I was thinking of leaving a ministry, 
and um, Gail Irwin had come over for, for lunch, and I asked him, you know, I'm thinking of, of dropping some ministries, but I'm going to replace them with starting a Bible study out in Roland Heights, because I felt that maybe the Lord might be calling me to Roland Heights. <clears throat> and so I started a Bible study in Roland Heights, and Gail Irwin said this to me, and I don't know if you know who Gail Irwin is, he wrote the book, uh, The Jesus Style, and then God's Style, it's great, great uh, communicator of the gospel. I mean, he's just a, a funny guy, able to get it across to you. you. You get it, you know, and it sticks with you. And he said this to me, and I'll never forget it, and it's something that I live by. He, says, he said that, that when God gives you something, he never takes it away unless he's giving you something else to do. You know? And so I learned that, that I'm not going to let something go unless I'm going to have something else to do for the Lord. And that's a principle that I live by. What is God going to give me if he's going to take away something? And so um, it's better to do that than to walk backwards. Uh, everyone shall wail. It says, for the foundations of Kir Harir Seth you shall mourn. Surely they are stricken for the fields of Hishbon languish. And the vine of Shemeth, the lords of the nations, have broken down its choice plants, which have reached to Jazer and wandered through the wilderness. Her branches are st stretched out. They are gone over the sea. And so Israel sorrows over Moab. Therefore I will bewail the vine of Shemeth with the weeping of Jazar. I will drench you with my tears, O Hishbon and El -E Eli, for the battle cries have fallen over your summer fruits and your harvest. So they're really being judged. Everything is being judged. Even their harvest is being judged, their fields and so forth. Gladness is taken away. There's no joy. Uh, the, and joy from the plentiful fields in the vineyards. There is no, there will be no uh, singing, nor will there be shouting. Uh, no traders will tread out wine in the presses. I have made their shouting cease. Therefore my heart shall resound like a harp for Moab and my inner being for Kishir's, and it shall come to pass when it is seen that Moab is weary on the high places that he will come to a sanctuary to pray, but he will not prevail. You know, the only prayer that God really wants to hear at this point is a prayer of what? Repentance, right? Lord, I've made a mistake, you know, and I need to repent and turn back to you and once again come under your mighty shadow. This is the word which the Lord had spoken concerning Moab since that time. But now the Lord has spoken, saying, Within three years, as the years of a hired man, the glory of Moab will be despaired, despised with all that, that great multitude, and the remnant will be very small and feeble. So God's judgment will humble Moab at that time. Now remember, God is judging pretty much all of the nation's in that area because they have left the Lord, including Judah the, the, uh, and, and Israel, the northern and southern uh, parts of Israel. And he's using Babylon and Assyria just to do it. Now we come to chapter 17 and we see the burden against Syria and Israel. Uh, a prophecy of doom upon Syria and Israel because they've left the Lord. Uh, Damascus and Ephraim, uh, Damascus is Syria and, and Israel, they join forces together. Uh, Ephraim there joins with Syria uh, to fight against the enemy, but they're not going to be successful. Israel made a, an ally, but it wasn't strong enough. So it says, the burden against Damascus, behold, Damascus will cease from being a city and it will be a ruined heap. Now, Damascus is one of the greatest cities of the ancient world and the capital of the ancient nation of Syria. So it was a beautiful city. Uh, it, it had ver many, many resources uh, that uh, just made it that beautiful city there in Syria. And it will be taken and it will become a heap of ruins because of their sin. The cities of Eror are forsaken. They will be for flocks which lie down and no one will make them afraid. The fortresses also will cease from Ephraim the kingdoms from Damascus and the remnant of Syria. They will be as the glory of the children of Israel, says the Lord of hosts. In that day it shall come to pass that the glory of Jacob will wane 
and the fatness of his flesh grow lean. It shall be as when the harvesters gather the grain and reap the heads with his arm. It shall be as he has he who gathers heads of grain in the valley of Rimpham. Yet gleaning grapes will be left in it, like the shaking of an olive tree. Two or three olives at the top of the uttermost broth. Four or five in its most fruitful branches, says the Lord God of Israel. So all the inhabitants will be totally destroyed. There's not going to be anything left. I mean, like the like the, the olive branch shaking and just nothing, maybe one or two that will be on the branch. It will be totally destroyed. Um, this is a picture of what will happen during the tribulation period. There, there is no hope for those that don't know God during that time. I mean, they will be destroyed. And ultimately... God will sit upon the throne and judge all unrighteousness and evil. And they will be separated from him and cast out to outer darkness. And so when God says something, he means it and he will fulfill it. You can guarantee that. And it's sad that we live as though God doesn't mean what he says. Doesn't mean what he says. And yet he does mean what he says. At the men's breakfast, Pastor Jerry did a great job as he shared with us on the importance of Scripture and believing what Scripture says. And it was interesting that the religious people who knew the Scriptures, they knew it backwards and forward. You go in Israel today, and some of these Israelites know Scriptures. They can quote Scriptures. Our our tour guide, um, Yossi, man, that guy knew a lot about the New Testament. He knew Scriptures. He can quote the Scriptures. Uh, when he was taking us from place to place, he was reciting Scriptures, sharing Scriptures, and didn't even have anything in front of him to remind him. It just came out naturally. They know Scriptures, but they don't know what they mean. They really don't know the power behind the Scriptures. And so that was where the air comes in. There's no power. There's no faith. There's no trust. There really is no walk with God. They know him in their head. They read these things as though they're true, but it never gets in here in their lives. And so they're living lives without God. And sometimes Christians know it here, and it's here, but they really don't live it out. And we need to live it out. And it's sad when you see a Christian not living it out, not being active with it. And in a sense, they're just lukewarm, you know, and they're not doing anything with what God has done in their own heart. Um, and I think every Christian needs to, if it's real to them, that they need to be doing something. So the humble response to the judgment of the Lord. Look at verse 7. In that day a man will look to his maker, and his eyes will have respect for the Holy One of Israel. He will not look to the altar, the work of his hands. He will not respect what his fingers have made, nor the wooden image nor the incense altar. In that day, his strong cities will be as a forsaken broth and an utmost branch, which they left because of the children of Israel, and there will be desolation. So he's not going to look to his own work, to his own hands, what he has done with his fingers, but he's going to look to the Maker, God Almighty, who sits in judgment. And God will take that work and bring it to nothing. Verse 10, because you have forsaken the God of your salvation, and have not been mindful of the rock of your stronghold. Therefore you will plant pleasant plants and set out foreign seedlings. In that day you will make your plants to grow, and in the morning you will make your seeds to flourish. But the harvest will be a heap of ruin in the day of grief and desperate sorrow. The reason that there is no fruit in Israel is because Israel went after false idols. And instead of worshiping God, they began to worship the idols of the other nations. And so God allowed the Assyrians to come in and punish them because of that idolatry. We need to be careful that we are not worshiping false idols. False idols. What is an idol? Paul tells us in Colossians that covetousness is idolatry. And so he makes it clear that that anything that we covet is idolatry. It becomes an idol to us. It doesn't matter what that thing is. You you might not go home, you know, and and go out to your backyard and, and just water the dirt a little bit and then take that dirt 
and start shaping it, you know, making a, a, a round body and then making a round head and then making some round fat legs and putting it on there with little arms and stuff like that and then putting the ears and molding out a couple of eyes and then a little eye and then just hardening that thing, letting it bake in the sun and then put it on your, your window seal there in your kitchen so that when you're, you're baking and stuff, oh, there's my idol, there's my God. You may not do that and I don't think anybody really does that today. There are some religions that have saints, you know, that they go to and they light a candle to it and they pray to it and in hopes that that idol or that person that it represents will hear their prayer. When the Bible's clear that we have one meter between God and man and that's Jesus Christ and we can go straight to Him, right? But we may not do that. But do we covet? Do we covet other things? Do we put other things before God? There are those that do that. They like the fact that they have the liberties in God to do other things. And it's wonderful. But sometimes they take those liberties to an extreme. And you need to be careful that you're not taking them to an extreme. You know, the other way is true also. You know, sometimes we, we think, well, I'm so humble, I don't deserve anything. Well, that's not true either. We have to find the balance. You, know, you can't go one way. You know, uh, yeah, you have to drive a car. You need a car to work. You know, but do you have to get a Rolls Royce? Do you really need to get a Rolls Royce? Do you really need to you know, drive a Mercedes you know, or a, a Mustang? You know, why can't you get a Taurus? Do they make Tauruses anymore? I don't even know if they make Tauruses anymore. <laughs> why can't you get something smaller that just gets you to work and gets you home? You know, um, do we really need to? And then, and then it's okay because you can have a Mustang. You can have a Camaro. You can have a, even, a, even a Mercedes. I, I, I had lunch with the pastor <laughs> Uh, we were going to talk about uh, uh, ministry in Israel, and, and so I went out to meet him. And he happened to drive up right when I drove up, and he drove up in a Mercedes. And it was funny because as soon as he, he said hi and so forth, he goes, I just have to explain to you that I got that Mercedes. Somebody actually gave me such a great deal on that Mercedes, you know, that it was just I couldn't pass it up. You know, it's a good car and so forth. And I was just laughing. It's like, why are you explaining that to me? You know, like, what do I care? You know, but it was kind of shocking. Here he is driving up in a Mercedes, you know, but he got it at a great deal. And, and that's fine as long as it's not your idol, as long as you don't depend on it, as long as you're not out there Sunday morning you're, buffing it up and shining it up, you know, when you should be in church, right? When you should be worshiping God, when you should be praying. Same goes with our jobs. I, I know that we're living, uh, you know, in a day where the economy is bad, you know, and it's very difficult and you have to get work wherever you can, you know, but you need a day of worship. You need a day of worship. God tells us not to forsake the assembling of one another, especially as we see the day approaching especially as we see the day approaching. Boy, it, it was important, you know, a hundred years ago, but how much more now as we see the day approaching that we should be in fellowship with the body of Christ. But if your job takes you away from that, you know, is it your idol? Yeah, but, but you don't know how much I really need that money, really? I mean, that's what they said about their little idols. You don't know how much I really need resources. You don't know how much I really need you to cause rain to come on my crops. We'll starve to death. It's not going to do anything, you know, praying to that little idol. It's not going to give you the rain. But you come here and you worship the Lord and you're faithful in putting Him first and He promises to take care of you. He promises to take care of you. It's amazing how many times I've seen men come in here and Families come in here and they're, they're jobless, you know, and that's what's, what drew them here in the first place. Okay, let's go seek God now because we need Him. And so they come you know, the church, and not just this church, any church. They, they do it all the time or they're requesting prayer because they're losing their house or whatever. You know, and it's, I always find it interesting that God then blesses them because they're being faithful and coming here, but then they start falling away. They start falling away. They start working so much, you know, because they got this new job and now they have to work that they're no longer in church anymore. You know, and that's sad. And then all of a sudden they're in the same situation. And then God allows them because He's so gracious and loving and caring. So He allows them to until all of a sudden they're like, we don't have a job again. What do we need to do? We need to change something. Yeah, go back. <laughs> go back and sit at the feet of the Lord. You know? So you need to be careful that we don't make things are idols because they come before God. God doesn't um, 
like things to come before him. He wants to be number one in our lives. He wants that relationship. He, he wants us to be at his feet, you know, praying and seeking him and just being in love with him. And everything else just falls into place. It really does. I've seen it over and over again. Woe to the multitude of many people, verse 12, who make a noise like the roar of a sea and to the rushing of nations that make a rushing like the rushing of mighty waters. The nations will rush like the rushing of many waters, but God will rebuke them and they will flee far away and be chased like the shaft of the mountains before the winds, like a rolling thing before the whirlwind. Then behold, at eventide trouble, and before the morning he is no more. This is the portion of those who plunder us, and the lot of those who rob us. So God, and it's interesting how God can use, because you have to ask yourself, why is God using the Assyrians to judge these nations aren't the Assyrians sinners too and they are they're probably worse sinners than Moab and Israel and so forth but yet God uses the sinners to judge the sinners and God will sometimes use the world to judge us you know he'll use the world to judge us sometimes God will use the world to convict us because the world is living more righteous than we are and there's men that 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 live moral lives and they put us to shame sometimes they don't know the Lord, but they're living moral lives because they feel that it's a good thing to do to have a nice life. You live a moral life. You be good, you do good, and you know, life will be fair with you kind of attitude. You know, it doesn't always work, but there's no God in it, but that's how they live because they feel they don't lie, they don't cheat, and they're honest men. And some people put us to shame as believers. You know? And God will use them to correct us sometimes. So God will use whoever he wants to use to do whatever he wants to do. You know, because he wants the person that he's uh, attacking or judging or correcting to return. And that's all about love. It's all about grace towards those that, that he loves. Because he misses them at his feet. He, he loves it when his children are at his feet. So we come to chapter 19. And we see this burden against Egypt. As God strikes Egypt. The burden against Egypt. Behold, the Lord rides on a swift cloud. And will come into Egypt. The idols of Egypt will totter at his presence. Now you know how many idols Egypt has. Just the ten plagues that, that, that uh, God told Moses to bring upon Egypt are evidence of at least ten idols that were there. You know, and so, 19. Oh, I missed 18, I'm sorry. Trying to get you guys out of here early, but okay. <laughs> 18. Got to get Ethiopia's judgment first, right? <clears throat> okay, Ethiopia now, who was also rising in power and ruling over Egypt and was a chief rival against the Assyrians, wanted to, in a sense, create a unity with other nations so that they could battle against them. And that's not what God wanted to do. And so he's going to judge them um, because of that and because of their sin. Now some believe that the United States is here in chapter 18. In the, in the first verse there. And I don't know how they get that, but um, talking about pulling things out of context and really reading into the text. But it says, Woe to the land shadowed with buzzing wings, which is beyond the rivers of Ethiopia. And they say that, you know, United States emblem is the eagle, a buzzard, you know, with the wings and so forth, buzzing wings and flying. And so some have tried to say that this is speaking to the United States and the judgment was going to come upon them. I don't see that at all in here. Um, that's really pulling it out. I don't know if you even see his, uh, his United States in prophecy at all. For whatever reason, we're, we're not in prophecy, just that we're there by the wayside watching what's going on around. Um, Ezekiel tells us that. I think that uh, what's going on with our president today, who's kind of just watching on the... You know, spectator stand, seeing what's happening, really has no idea what to do, and so he's just watching things unfold, and it's uh, it's the demise of our great nation. 
But they're really pulling this out of context to say that this is the United States. Uh, which sends ambassadors by sea, even in vessels of reeds on the water, saying, Go swift messengers to a nation tall and smooth of skin, to a people terrible from their beginning onward, a nation powerful, treading down, whose land the rivers divide. Uh, again, the picture really is of Ethiopia and is speaking to Ethiopia here. So they're trying to get this confederacy and so God is going to reject this. In all the inhabitants, verse 3, of the world and dwellers on the earth, when he lifts up a banner on the mountain, you see it. And when he blows a trumpet, you hear it. For so the Lord said to me, I will take my rest. I will look from my dwelling place like clear heat in sunshine, like a cloud of dew in the heat of the harvest. Uh, so, in a sense, God is saying, I'm going to reject your confederacy, your getting together. God has never really liked us to get together and create a great nation. You see it in the Tower of Babel when they all tried to get together. And what did he do? He confused their language. They couldn't get together. And we see it throughout history, the Roman Empire and you know, uh, Russia, Britain, you know, trying to conquer the whole world and, and so forth. And God just really has never wanted that to happen. He, he wanted this division, a uh, division of people and, and nations and so forth. You see it in Revelations when you see tongues and nations and they're all worshiping the Lord. And today, what are they doing? One world government. They're really trying to cause a one world government to take place. Uh, Washington. Uh, there are vehicles there right now from Homeland Security all over the place. Where are they there? UN is there. You go to Israel and you'll see UN vehicles traveling all over the place. These are the United Nations. These are governments that all these nations are a part of and hopefully this, uh, this desire of being a one world government which makes sense to them to unify so that we can share all resources and become one great nation. No more, no more fighting but just having peace and harmony in the world today. And that's their ultimate goal but it's just not going to work. Because you have somebody in charge. I was reading somewhere where, where um, the president's wife has been recorded to be the most expensive uh, first lady ever in history. She has spent millions and millions of dollars uh, on herself. She's had the most AIDS, something like, I, I remember counting eight to ten AIDS where, where she has aides that are helping her prepare parties and then aides for those people that are helping prepare parties that are getting paid from anywhere from $250,000 a year to $68,000 a year. You know, and it's crazy because you see this and their luxurious life and then there's this whole push for unity and giving the wealth away to distribute to the poor, but yet they're living this luxurious life. See, someone has to live it. And, and they have chosen themselves to live it so that they can give it all to the poor, but not theirs, someone else's. You know, so someone's always in charge and someone is always uh, in love with money and resources and so you just can't have the peace that they want. It's just not going to work. God doesn't want that because He knows that's what will happen. For before the harvest, when the bud is perfect and the sour grape is ripening in the flowers, He will both cut off the spring with pruning hooks and take away the cut downs and cut down the branches. They will be left together for the mountain birds of prey and for the beasts of the earth. The birds of prey will summer on them and all the beasts of the earth will winter on them. So Isaiah is saying is that God's going to cut them down completely. And, and that Assyria therefore really has no need for a confederacy to fight against them. In that time... A present will be brought <clears throat> to the Lord of hosts from the people tall and smooth of skin and from a people terrible from their beginning onward, a nation powerful and treading down whose land the river divides and the place <clears throat> of the name of the Lord of hosts to Mount Zion. Again, future, they will come to worship you know, the Lord. Okay, now let's go to 19. And since I already kind of explained it to you, we'll get right into it. Verse 1. The burden against Egypt. Behold, the Lord rides on a swift cloud. 
<clears throat> and will come into Egypt. The idols of Egypt will totter at his presence, and the heart of Egypt will melt in its midst. I will set Egyptians against Egyptians. Everyone will fight against his brother and everyone against his neighbor. City against city, kingdom against kingdom. The spirit of Egypt will fail in its midst. I will destroy their counsel and they will consult the idols and the charmers, the mediums and the sorcerers. And the Egyptians uh, I will give into the hand of a cruel master and a fierce king will rule over them, says the Lord, the Lord of hosts. Egypt represents what? The world, right? We know that, that Egypt represents the world. And the world enslaves you like it did the children of Israel. And the world wants to keep you enslaved, but God's come to free you, so he takes you out of the world. He takes you out of Egypt. He sends you to a promised land, a prosperous life in the land of Canaan, which is the Christian life in in victory with Christ Jesus. But we're not to go back to Egypt. We're not to love Egypt. We're not to be a part of Egypt. And it's funny how uh, this is a picture here, and I'm not saying dogmatically, but but we can see the United States being Egypt and what prosperity we have had in Egypt and the idols that are here in the United States. And one day God is going to you know, judge all that. So we really can't even depend upon the United States. Our focus should be upon God himself because the Lord will strike Egypt and dry it up. Look at verse 5. The waters will fail from the sea and the river will waste and dry up. The rivers will turn foul. The brooks of defense will be emptied and dried up. The reeds and rushes will wither. The papyrus reeds by the river, by the mouth of the river, and everything sown by the river will be winter, will wither, be driven away and be no more. The fishermen also will mourn all those who will lament who cast hooks into the river and they will lang- languish who spread nets on the waters. Moreover, those who work in fine flax and those who wave fine fabric will be ashamed and its foundations will be broken. All who make wages will be troubled of soul. Now he's talking about damming up that river. God is going to, to pretty much dry it up in judgment against them. He goes on in judgment. Surely the prince of Zoan are fools. Pharaoh's wise counselors give foolish counsel. How do you say to Pharaoh, I am the son of the wise, the son of the ancient king? Where are they? Where are your wise men? Let them tell you now. and Let them know what the Lord of hosts has purposed against you. The prince of Zoan has, have become fools. The prince of Nophed are deceived. They have also deluded Egypt those who are the mainstay of its tribes. The Lord has mangled a perverse spirit in her midst. <clears throat> and they have caused Egypt to err in all her works as a drunken man staggers in his vomit. Either will there be any work for Egypt which the head or tail, palm branches or bulrush may do. In that day, Egypt will be like woman and will be afraid and fear because of the waving of the hand of the Lord of hosts, which he waves over it. When he says in that day, he's talking about future. So in that day, <clears throat> the tribulation period, the Lord will judge even Egypt itself. The land of Judah will be a terror to Egypt. Everyone who makes mention of it will be afraid in himself because of the counsel of the Lord of hosts, which he has determined against it. But in that day, Egypt will turn to the Lord also. In that day, five cities in the land of Egypt will speak the language of Canaan and swear by the Lord of hosts. One will be called the city of destruction. In that day, there will be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt and a pillar to the Lord at its borders, and it will be for a sign and for a witness to the Lord of hosts in the land of Egypt, for they will cry to the Lord because of the oppressors, and he will send them a savior, a mighty one, and he will deliver them. Then the Lord will be known in Egypt, or to Egypt, and the Egyptians will know the Lord in that day, and will make sacrifice and offerings. Yes, they will make a vow to the Lord and perform it. 
So in that day, the day of Jesus, there will be millions of Jews who will be living there in Egypt. And when God judges them, then they will turn to the Lord in that day. In the early days of Christianity, when Jesus walked among the earth, um, there were many Jews that lived in Egypt. And the judgment came upon them and they were scattered in AD 70 throughout the rest of the world. And in the early days of, uh, of when Christ was there, there was a strong but yet vital church afterwards in Egypt for almost 600 years. Egyptians were there. And of course today, you don't see that in Egypt. But there was the church there. In fact, if you, uh, <clears throat> if you know this, and I think I shared it with, it, with you before, uh, Christianity was was really well known in Egypt. They had made little um, paper crocheted little figures out of scriptures. So there were so much scriptures in Egypt that they were using it as paper mache. And, and they found these artifacts with scriptures on it. And I think it's uh, Josh McDowell who's trying to separate them all now and, and, and see which books are there. But paper mache, that's what we do with newspapers today, right? You make a piñata in our culture or... Or you make uh, some sort of artwork, you know, and you use paper mache. You, you use papers. You just save up stacks and stacks of paper to do your paper mache. Well, they did that with the scriptures, you know. So there was a time where Christianity was prevalent in Egypt itself. We don't see that today. Today now it's divided. Today we see some Orthodox there, but we see the Muslims occupying the land there and it being a, a Muslim uh, nation now. And God's going to judge that Muslim nation. And the Lord will strike Egypt. He will strike and heal it. They will return to the Lord and He will be entreated by them and heal them. So, we come to verse 23 as we see peace between three formerly hostile enemies. In that day, there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria. And the Assyrians will come into Egypt and the Egyptians to Assyria. And the Egyptians will serve with the Assyrians. And that day Israel will be one of the three with Egypt and Assyria. A blessing in the midst of the land whom the Lord of hosts shall bless. Saying, blessed is Egypt my people and Assyria the work of my hand and Israel my inheritance. And Assyria is actually Iraq. They will actually live in harmony one day. And again, this is speaking of future events. Right? Now we come to chapter 20. And we'll finish up here. It's a short chapter. God is warning Israel not to trust Egypt at that time. But to trust Him. And Isaiah, like some of the other prophets we saw in Ezekiel and and some of the other prophets, is going to act out something, you know, kind of uh, dramatically to bring a about a point to the children of Israel. Isaiah will be asked to run around naked, you know, uh, to bring uh, an example of God's judgment coming upon him. Not that he's completely naked, but when you say naked in the Old Testament, they usually had like a cloth around their waist. You would say today that he's going to be running around with his underwear, with his chonies. He's going to be running around all over the place, you know, as an example. So, So let's read it. In the year that Tartan came to Ashdod when Sargon, the king of Syria, sent him and he fought against Ashdod and took it. At the same time, the Lord spoke by Isaiah, the son of Amos, saying, Go and remove the sackcloth from your body and take your sandals off your feet. And he did so, walked, walking naked and barefoot. Then the Lord said, Just as my servant Isaiah has walked naked and barefoot three years for a sign and a wonder against Egypt and Ethiopia, so shall the king of Assyria lead away the Egyptians as prisoners and the Ethiopians as captives, young and old, naked and barefoot, with their buttlocks uncovered to the shame of Egypt. Can you imagine walking around naked for three years? That's crazy. What, what God had asked the prophets to do in the Old Testament is pretty crazy. And, you know, it's crazy stuff. I mean, starting with, with Noah, right? 
you know, God says, no, I want you to build a boat. What for? Because there's rain coming. What's rain? Never seen rain before. Never seen it flood before. You want me to build a boat. And so Noah then starts to build a boat. He's what? Faithful to the Lord to do it. He doesn't understand it, but he's faithful to the Lord to do it. You know, and sometimes we don't understand things, but God wants us to be faithful to what God is asking us to do, right? Let's just be faithful. And so there he goes. Start collecting the wood and start collecting the pitch and he's building a boat. And people are walking by laughing and mocking at him like, what are you doing? The world coming to an end. And so forth. But he was faithful to do it even though it, it was ridiculous in his eyes. You know, be, before the people even. You know, and we see this throughout, throughout scriptures when God asks men to do certain things, you know. Uh, like Isaiah, run around naked for three whole years. You know, there you, there you go, wake up in the morning. I, what am I going to wear? Nothing. <laughs> you know, well, where are you going to lunch? I don't know, let's go to McDonald's. Are you going to go dress like that? Yeah, I got to go dress like that, <laughs> you know. And dinner too, I've got to walk around like this for three whole years, no matter where you're at. You go into the temple of the Lord to worship, and there you are naked. You know, and people are looking at you, and they're laughing. Why are you naked? Where are your clothes? The Lord has spoken to me. I am to be naked. And it's a warning to you because Assyrians will come in and they will take you barefoot and naked away. Be warned. You know, and they're like, you're crazy. You know, we have power. We have armies. We have this confederacy. We're lining up with people. We're protected. We're okay. But you're walking around like a lunatic naked. You know, something's wrong with you, Isaiah. You know, and he's asked people to do that. You look at John the Baptist, right? Out in the wilderness, eating locusts. You know, hairy and, you know, smells like a camel probably. You know, had a, a waistband around his thing and he's walking around. Repent. What are you doing? Repent. The kingdom's at hand. What kingdom are you talking about? The kingdom of God is already here. We're the Israelites. We're going to rule and reign. No, repent. The kingdom of God is at hand. I'm preparing the way. For what? For the Messiah. Oh, you're just crazy. You're one of these guys who stands a corner with naked, with a board on each side. The world's coming to an end. You know, you're one of those guys, you know. But God told him to do it. God told him to do it. You know. Do what God is telling you to do. I was talking to a, a, a pastor friend of mine, and he's starting a new church, and and he was uh, trying to get some artwork done, and he had an idea of what he wanted to see on the artwork, you know, because they try to keep a theme. And so, so I guess the person that's doing the artwork uh, brought some stuff that really wasn't what he wanted, you know. So, so now here I am in a dilemma. Do I, do I tell them or do I just kind of let it go? And, you know, and I'm like, you got to do what God says. <laughs> you got to do what God says. He goes, yeah, I know. I know. So I, I'm just going to tell them that's not what the Lord told me to do. To, to, to have as a design. We need to do it over again. You know? You've got to do what God says. You've got to be faithful to God. No matter how silly it looks, no matter you know, if people agree with you, you just have to do it. You have to trust in the Lord completely that God is going to get you through it. You know? And in the end, it may take five years, it may take ten years, but in the end, you know, the fruit will be there and people say, well, God, he was right. You know? God did do a work. You know, I think of this ministry here. There were many people that thought, you know, you shouldn't be doing this. It's not right, you know, and you shouldn't be uh, starting a church here in this area, you know, and it's just not going to work. And, you know, we've been here now 19 years, and the Lord just continues to bless us. Yeah, it's a long time, but you know what? It's not about the size. It's, it's about the faithfulness, the faithfulness of the leadership, the faithfulness of the people. It's about growing in grace and allowing God to do what He wants to do and not what we want to do. If God wants us to be a big church, guess what? God has power to make it a big church, doesn't He? He just pushed me out of the way and said, Reuben, get out of the way. I want this to be a big church. If I'm the one that's hindering it, He can just say, get out of the way, and boom, He can do it. He can just point at me, I'll drop dead, and then someone else will take it over. That's what He wants, because God is God. I mean, I can't fight against that, because He's God, and I want His will to be done, but He doesn't want it. He wants me. You know, a donkey to sit up here and, and read scriptures like this and going, what am I doing up here? You know, um, I don't know why. And, and he has you here to fulfill whatever reasons that, that he has you here for. You know, it's his will be done. He adds to the body of Christ. We, we plant and we water. 
We take those seeds that other people have planted and we water. And we've seen people come to know the Lord Jesus. And so if one comes to the Lord, wonderful. That's more than Jeremiah, and he was a great prophet of God. And we've seen a lot of people come to the Lord. And, and God just continues to, to do that here. You know, um, last year was a great year. And now already this year we're starting again. We're going to have asphalt in the back over there and asphalt on this side. And I think even asphalt on the outside if we can get it out there too and get it all paved and clean and no more dust all over the place. We have plans to, to build a patio up again and, and put canopies and hopefully build this wall up, you know, and just see what God does. And we're just hoping that, that he'll continue to provide for us and, and take care of us. And he has. You know, I can't fight against God's will. God's will will be done. We have to trust in Him. And so sometimes He asks us to do strange things, but we have to do it. We have to take those steps of faith. You know, think of Chuck when he started ministering to the hippies. What are you doing? Ministering to hippies, long-haired, with barefoot, and they're coming into your church, and they're dirtying up the carpet and so forth. And we'll rip up the carpet. We'll let them come in, you know. What are you doing, Chuck? He says, I'm ministering. I'm ministering, I'm doing what God has called me to do. And he even thought it was crazy, right? I mean, you hear the testimonies. It was his wife that really wanted to minister to the hippies. He was like, no, not the hippies. He didn't really want to do it, but he listened to her and, you know, boom. <laughs> Look at what has happened because he had listened to his wife who was sensitive to the spirit and saw the need of hurting young people out there. And there are hurting young people out here today, I mean, in this community there was a, the DEA was just across the street. I mean, you're talking 15 cars, police cars, and they're all over there all morning long. You know, I'm sure they busted the, whoever was there. I don't know if the guy was the guy that came over here that one night. May have been. And he was looking for hope. Who knows? You know, and he heard the gospel message and went back. Haven't seen him since, but maybe he got busted. And there's a purpose for all that. You know, they, they were right there. So are people hurting? Yes, they're hurting. And we need to be that light that shines in this community. You know, it's a dark community. It's a lonely community. There are no churches like this church in this little community. You know, of 6,000 homes in Mariloma, probably more like seven now, 7,000 homes in Mariloma. But God loves Mariloma. God loves the people in Mariloma. He loves the Hispanic population that speaks Spanish only, and he loves the children of those people that speak English. You know, and we have both here. He's setting things up, and we just have to trust in him you know, and have faithfulness and be patient and wait upon him. And really, it's all about patience, isn't it? Being patient that God is doing a work and trusting that. But I don't see it. Yeah, a hundred was how many? How many years did it take Noah to build the ark? Yeah, that's a long time to build a boat. <laughs> we'll only be here 19 years. So we've got 100 years to go. And who knows, if God tarries, it may be another 100 years. But hey, God's will be done. He's, he's going to reach the lost you know, in his timing. So he asks us to do strange things sometimes. You know? and, and we have to be faithful to him and be patient. I don't know how many people have come in through here wanting to see these things and they get so impatient because they're not seeing it the, when they want it. Like, like they're going to tell God, this is what I want to see. And if I don't see it, I'm out of here, God. That's not how God works. It's not how God works. You, know, you have to join his program. You have to be faithful to what he's given you and let him do the work. Um, <clears throat> see, what happens is that we start blaming because we don't see what we want to see. So we start, well, why is it? It must be that person. It must be the location. It must be this, you know. Maybe it's God. Maybe it's God's timing. Maybe God's not ready, you know. Maybe God's waiting for a reason. And we need to just trust in Him. Then the Lord said, verse 3, Just as my servant Isaiah has walked naked and barefoot, oh, He judged them. So, yeah, so, so they're going to be taken naked, walking around with their rear ends sticking out. <clears throat> Then they shall be afraid and ashamed of Ethiopia, their expectation, and Egypt, their glory. And the inhabitants of this territory will say, In that day, surely such is our expectation. Wherever we flee for help to be delivered from the king of Assyria, and how shall we escape? So they will be utterly destroyed too. 
Isaiah is a neat book because it shows you God's correction and love for his people. And it shows you how his whole purpose is to restore them. And that when he restores them, he restores them. And they rebuild their temple. And he begins to pour out his blessings upon them too. That's where I want to be. I want to be in, under God's grace and under his blessings and just trusting in him. And, and it gives us a picture of the future and, and what our future holds for us. You know, when we're raptured out of this world, that God's judgment will come upon the world and he will, in a sense, clean the world, make a new one where we will dwell for eternity. And all nations and all tongues will be here in peace and unity. Even the animals will be at peace with humanity. And that will be awesome when that day comes. So whatever you're going through, whatever sorrows that you're experiencing, whatever pain, financial difficulties, keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Don't put Him anywhere else. Trust in Him. Let God know your heart and then let Him have it. He's able. He is more than able.